When you get to a level of success, you start to load pain. And even when you know you should indulge in something, sometimes it's good to prevent yourself from it, just to train yourself. One of the things Allah Tabarak to Adam mentioned in the Quran is that when the verses are recited in the believers, added to Iman, that the Iman increases and it has a general impact on the heart. What do they always talk about in these careful books in the morning? The Prophet put yeah, the dua'at, put yeah, barakah right, in the morning right. time. Yeah. And what did the Prophet say? Prophet said, after Isha, don't stay awake. Mm. Don't talk to anyone. Words that should come out of your mouth after Isha, if you talk to your wife, you worship Allah, otherwise go to sleep. And they talk about broken sleep is good for you not sleeping eight hours what do we know the Prophet used to stand in the middle of the night for Tajj he was even talking about how destructive food is I did it so hard as I finished the set and I went to failure and the guy behind me screaming saying you don't have to be so loud <laughs> <laughs> hey guys in this episode I got a little bit personal um, and I felt like it was necessary so I can share these lessons with you guys these real life experiences so you can also take heed and um, guys I, I'm going to be planning to do this inshallah ta'ala throughout the rest of the podcast Chow Mabai Righteous and Rich if you guys subscribe um, at this channel inshallah ta'ala you're going to see a lot more that's coming and um, yeah man there's a lot I've been holding back throughout the years but I feel like it's time to just keep it real because I know how much you guys will benefit from this so so subscribe inshallah ta'ala and hopefully you guys will benefit man Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah amma ba'd Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh People, welcome back to Chai Ma Bai This is that show where we show you how to thrive in your deen and your dunya We give you real life experiences from our life And also lessons from the Quran and the Sunnah in doing so Unfortunately, we don't have Abu Bakr here today um, He had a, a death in his family We ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to have mercy And to forgive the deceased um, very sad story but nonetheless inshallah ta'ala we're here and uh we're gonna inshallah hopefully share with you guys a lot of lessons and benefits today in the ta'ala so the topic of discussion discussion today um barakallah feek akhi fawaz man you 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 suggested it and it's actually a topic that considering where i'm at in my life right now came at a very 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 pertinent time is um personal development and the quran right so personal development being, you know, self-help, self-improvement type of books and courses that we hear about. That's a whole subject that's like studied and researched now, right? Um, and the Quran, because the Quran also calls you to improve yourself, to better yourself, to become better, right? Now, you've got people that are going to the Quran, you've got people that are going through these books. Is that right? Is it wrong? Should they just be going to the Quran? Is there a balance? Chat to me, bro. Nah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, I think people don't really understand one thing, mm. right? There's nothing wrong with taking benefit out of what a non-Muslim says. Mm. I actually spoke to my teacher about this issue uh, once, right? And I was like, Ustad, if like, let's say a non-Muslim says something and there's khair in it, is there a problem in me taking it? He goes, does it align with the Quran and Sunnah? I goes, well, it doesn't go against it, let's say, mm. per se. He goes, it doesn't matter. A Muslim is with the truth, you know? He says if it's a Muslim and he's speaking the truth, he's with the Muslim. Mm. If it's a kafir who's speaking the truth, he's still with the kafir. Yeah. And he says if a kafir lies, what? You abandon the kafir. But if a Muslim lies, you stay upon him until he enters the truth. Okay. So he provided me a lot of perspective. Like, there's nothing wrong with taking from kuffar. Of course, if it's good, right? If it's benefit and it doesn't go against the deen. There is a crazy delete for that, which my sheikh told me. I literally had the same conversation a couple of days ago because mm. one of the things I've been doing is I've been reading these books a lot recently, right? I've been getting to the point where I'm finishing like three, a book every like four days. Uh, not every four days, but some books four days. Right, right now, I just set myself a goal to finish a book in two days. I finish it in two days and, and like one hour <laughs> the next day. And I've just been going through it, man, because I got to a stage where I realized there's certain skills that I'm lacking, certain things I need to learn. But the thing is, it starts bugging me because some of these books, they're riddled with that shirk in it. They're riddled with that kufa. Mm. Like sometimes it's there, like... You think this is such a good book, but then there's one chapter the guy had to put like some kufar in there. Like he had to tell us about some love the universe nonsense, mm, yeah. or no, sorry, not love uh, the universe gives, mm. seek from the universe sorry. type of nonsense, some sign like that, right? So I got the point you didn't read. Like it was bugging me. Like it's really annoying because you don't want to keep hearing that kufar and that shit. I'm reading, and one part I'm like, yeah, that was sick. And the next part I'm like, Pfft. you know, I want to just dash it, but obviously, you know, you don't dash, you know, books and stuff like that. So. Um, I said to the Sheikh Sheikh like, Would you advise me Not even some brothers Are asking me Recommend a book to me And I'm like Reluctant to recommend it Because there's so much khair. There's one chapter That could misguide him though The Sheikh said to me Amran Read the books 
And by the way, there's a context to everything I'm about to say right now, which is a person who knows aqidah, a person who knows creed, who knows belief, who knows iman. He's got a basis at the very least in the sense where you don't present yourself to, you don't present yourself to fitna, right? That like you don't present yourself to doubts. The Prophet sallallahu said, Dajjal, if you hear he comes, go the other way, right? Because he's going to bring doubts. He's going to confuse you about your deen. And, the, and mem- imagine people are going to think, ah, oh, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to go see the Jalla. I want to see what the hype is about. He's, they're going to become misguided. Like you will ask, people actually come in the morning as believers and at night they will leave as disbelievers, right? So the Sheikh's talking in the context of people that study in Aqidah. They know in Aqidah, right? And it's not like they're reading a book on philosophy or a book on some falsehood, but it's like riddled in there in some type of way. He's, he's got a little chapter, a little paragraph. He's like, in that situation, he said, read the book. You know why? Because they've got things that used to be in the hands of the Muslims, but unfortunately the Muslims in recent times have started to what? Slightly, it's sad, man, because you, the Sheikh actually mentioned the historical uh, thing of it. He said these things used to, for example, in Egypt, like there was, there was actually like scholars, ulama that, would, that, that were the greatest minds, people who understood literature and psychology, all these things. What the Kufar did is they used to come to the lands of the Muslims and take our experts, not in Islamic sciences necessarily, but our experts in other sciences, right? The historians, the writers, the, 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 what you would call the thinkers, right? They would take them and make them work in their countries, in their universities, in their libraries, which ultimately left the Muslims without anything left. And then they put their ideologies in the lands of the Muslims and then it started to filter down, right? Mm. So he was saying, read this stuff. We need to get it back. And he told me a couple of authors who are like students of knowledge, who studied under some serious mashaykh and ulama, and they write about personal development from the Quran and Sunnah. He's like, these guys right here are different. He goes, like, they will literally, that thing that you're reading there, they will take it from the Quran and Sunnah, take it from ayat, a hadith, but there's not a lot of it. So we need more of it, right? And then he told me a delil. Which comes back to what you said. He said, when the Prophet sallallahu told Zayd ibn Thabit, radiallahu anhu, to go and learn Hebrew. Who do you think he learned Hebrew from? The Jews. They were not Muslim. The Prophet told him, go and learn this subject that will help and serve the deen. But ideally, if you had a Muslim to teach you, that would be the best situation and circumstance, right? But in this circumstance, they don't have a Muslim that's going to be able to teach you Hebrew. And we need to know this so we can, you know, use this language to serve the deen of Allah, right? To have someone that knows what their language is. If we need to go and, 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 and discuss with them and debate with them and research and respond or write and give doubt to them, we need it. To go to, he had to go to the Kufar to learn it mm. So again, like I said We're talking about people that know Aqidah It's not unrestricted And this doesn't mean that you go and you sit with innovators to teach you And you can find a person of the Sunnah But sometimes as you said You may have to go and find elements of the truth And when we say truth, we don't mean religious truth Because the religious mm. truth is all in the Quran and Sunnah But sometimes when it comes to things pertaining to the dunya certain expertise, business, whatnot, psychology, personal development You may, as you said, have to go You may have to go and read a book of a kafir or, Listen to a course because al haqqudara al the the truth is the lost property of the believer. What do you think, Saad? Chat to me, bro. Yeah, I give think, us the mizan. Um, huh? Give us the mizan. Give us the balance. Yeah, no, no, you, you're right. You're hundred percent right. Um, you know, it's interesting because you know you mentioned in the group the other day to um, the reading of the kitab ulul uh, himma. So I started reading it. Oh wow. Um, and ulul himma, by the way, it means means uh, high aspirations. Right, which which is all about <coughs> motivation, high goals. Reaching for high things, that's, yeah. that's what it means. And, uh, and very early on in the, in the Muqaddimah, the introduction of the book, he started you know, quoting some of the non-believers uh, in terms of their self-development books. Mm. And so I was shocked, so I went and searched <laughs> him up. Somebody from like, who was born in 1908, uh, I forgot the guy's name, something Joseph William or something like that. Um, so there is that sense of, you know, go to these books, benefit and etc. I do believe there's also the other side, which a lot of people, um, we know, the Quran is the book of guidance, it's the book of Hidayah, it's, 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 it's the book in which Allah Ta'ala gave to us so that we can better ourselves as human beings and live to the fullest as a Muslim in this world in the worship of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. Um, and that's within, you know, the explanation and the tafsir and, you know, you find these verses. But I also believe there's another aspect of the Quran which is, um, helps and has a huge impact on self-development that a lot of people don't realize. And that's just on the mere recitation of the Quran. One, one of the things Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran is that when the verses are recited on the believers, what happens to them? Zadatum imana, that the iman increases and it has a general impact on the person's qalb. And I feel like oh. uh, on the heart, right? 
And I feel like that's an aspect that people don't really give a lot of attention to. Uh, whereas you can read these verses and understand the meaning behind them. But just a general being a companion of the Quran and reading it as often as possible, like the companions used to, um, that recitation alone has a huge impact on you as a person. So it's, it's neat that you just mentioned that because when we talk about personal development, right? Personal development, from what I found, correct me if I'm wrong, if yeah. you guys, mm. and by the way, the way this, you just chip in, bro. Yeah, yeah just get involved. <laughs> That's how it works here. <laughs> the personal development focuses on five things spirituality, right? Spirituality, yeah. finances, relationships, mental health, physical health. Have I missed anything out? Yes. Uh, I guess you get our productivity in there as mm. well and whatnot. But yeah, yeah. but yeah, productivity is probably the sixth thing. Uh, yeah. If I've usually anything else will come back to one of these, yeah. right? The spirituality element, which you find in these books, is going to be shirk and kufr. Let's keep it real, right? All various different things that can lead a man astray. Do you understand? And really what I found is that people only even inserted spirituality. Because even the way they treat spirituality, they don't mean it in religious sense. They mean it in some like transcendent, like soul type of consciousness type of peace, meditation type of sense. Mm. They don't mean it as a religion, as a, as a, as a way of life. But they were forced to have some type of, you know what we call something which is like ruhani, something, something spiritual, something yeah. ruhi, something, something that you know, affects the soul, something that is like tazkiyah, you know, purification. They needed it because like, the, the, the soul needs that, 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 it needs that type of... Uh, do, do you know I've clocked from reading some of these books? Mm. Oh, some of these guys, they're just like, it's clear to me from reading this book, this guy wants Islam. Yeah, and I don't know if this guy is arrogant. What's going on? Why mm. he hasn't accepted the religion of Islam? But it's clear to me he wants Islam. But he wants Islam, yeah. Because they accept like sometimes they're like you have to accept that you know you're incomplete. Mm. You can't do everything. Seek help. Mm. You know there has to be some sort of higher power. I'm just like you, idiot, bro. Just take your shahada. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that, 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 so, that's the thing that matches mm. me. Out. But then, but what they do is that they put it to the universe. So, or some of the worst cases, they put it to yourself. Like well, the, the, the thing is like you can like do anything it's on you and you know what that's problematic because i spoke to my and some mm. people might say i i was told personal development is bad and i actually there's a question as we were driving i just asked mm. my sheikh, I said, sheikh why is this term bad the sheikh said term is not bad it's what they call it to in the term so what they call it to when you say personal development is one of the you know how like there's pillars there's arkan there's, there's mm. pillars of islam there's pillars pillars bro you can do this it's you you're the man you are the man and that's batil act because we know the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, "Ihris ala ma yanfa'uk. Strive to that which benefits you. Wasta'in billah, but seek help from Allah." At the exact same time, mm. the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam man came to me and said, "Shall I? I left my camel outside. Shall I try? Shall I tie the camel or shall I put my trust in Allah? As in, shall I take the means or shall I just leave it to Allah?" And the Prophet said, "Tie it, and at the exact same time, place your trust in Allah." So the point is, you got to put the work in, you got to put the efforts in, but at the same time. You got to trust in Allah. The morning we were told, say, Ya Hayu Ya Qayyum, Birahmatika Astaghitu, Aslih Lisha Nikula, Walata Kili Ila Nasidar Fatain. Every morning we were told, we say, we be to beg Allah, say, Allah, we beg you, beg you, beg you, beg you, beg you. Do not leave me to take care of myself for the twinkling of an eye. So the Islamic, as in when you read these things, these books, you got to read it through the lens of really and truly, all of these are means. But then there is the tawakkul element. And like you said, you find gaps. In what they write in, where they've accepted, but there's certain things that man just can't. And that, that's why I, I just 100% believe Muslims have it best. Apologies for the interruption, but I think you're gonna really wanna hear this. Now, myself and Abu Bakr moved to the UAE, to Dubai and Sharjah last year. And since then, people have been asking us nonstop, Aki, how can we also move to Dubai? Now, there are different ways, but there are two ways that are most common and most cost effective. The first way is to set up a business license, and that's probably the cheapest, easiest way. The second way is to invest in a property here. Now, alhamdulillah, we found a company here run by a brother that we know personally, who's been helping brother set up business licenses and also invest in properties in a completely halal way. Now, the experience that we had with him was second to none. I mean, the first time round, we had to pay so much extra. We're talking thousands of pounds extra to get our business license and our visa sorted. With him, it was very smooth, it was very swift. 
and Allahumma barik, there were no issues. And as far as I'm aware, up until now, he's had a hundred percent success rate in helping people get their, 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 their visas and their business licenses. Also, when it comes to property, Allahumma barik, he's one of the first in providing the completely halal property investment solutions here in the UAE. So if you're interested, check it out, inshallah, I'll go to the link below and uh, get more information if you're interested in. With that said, let's get back to the podcast, inshallah. When we're able, and that's why I tell Muslims, do read the book. Again, as you said, it's upon the standing that they have the basic form of tawheed, right? Tell them, read them books. Take everything out of them. Fill in the gaps. Mm. And what we're able to produce for the Muslims is perfect. Mm. Does that make sense? Or almost perfect. So one of the things, like even, I don't know if you know, um, it can't hurt me or something like that by David Goggins. You know, uh, I've I've yeah. heard of the book and I and and uh, the one where he's wearing like a a, a yeah. white suit on the cover, right? Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. thinking to actually purchase it a couple of days ago. I, I finished the book. Alhamdulillah, I finished it when I was in Egypt. Now it's a good I'm reading yeah. this book. It was like a very good book. It shows about how like there's so many limitations we place on our mind that actually aren't there. Does that make sense? But we tell ourselves we can't do something mm. or it's not possible to do something <coughs> when we can. Does mm. that make sense? It's like what I was telling the brothers. It's like everyone says like you. Cool, everyone has two arms, but some people are able to optimize the arms to do more. They go mm. to the gym, they're able to lift heavier, right? It's the same thing with your mind. Everyone has a mind, so it allows you to achieve things, right? But some people are able to go on then and optimize their minds to achieve more and to be able to get more out of themselves. Mm. So he's talking about these concepts and well, I'm reading this book, I'm like, boss. He's talking about how trauma affects you, the part of things in your past and how to use them as fuel, well, you which we know, to get yeah, book. It's, it's actually an Islamic concept, right? Mm. Using like, you know, these things when Allah, we see the prophets, for example, when they've been through something, they used it to like gain more belief in Allah. You know, even like we mentioned uh, in Shu'ara, you know, even the second part where Ibrahim is saying, I feel like everyone's my enemy apart from Allah. But then he goes on to use that, like Allah is the one who what, guided me. Allah is the one who feeds me, you know, everything. So he puts that trust back in Allah. But then this kafir in the book, what does he do? He basically calls himself a God when I'udhu billah. You know, so he starts to notice that as good as these books are in certain Jeez, parts. When I come across stuff like that, it just makes me want to dash you. The, yeah, well, yeah. Like, so, I, you know, you're reading, you're enjoying, you reach a certain point, you just, you just slap onto the next page. I can't even read it. I think that, and if you are reading those books and when you come across those things, you don't feel that, oh, that's Sorry, a problem, well, like, 100%. That's a problem. No, shall I tell you something shocking though? What you just said is deep. Like, I actually was literally speaking to our Sheikh about this today because there's a brother who's like kind of going through a little situation right now and he just disappeared, bro. He's going through some traumatic situation right now. And he just disappeared, bro. Like, he just disappeared. He's not responding to anyone. He's not responding to anyone's calls. Sheikh, wallah, he didn't rate that at all. He was like, bro, I do not rate that at all. He said, and telling me certain things he went through in life and certain difficulties that he saw. You know what he said? He said, wallahi. And I went through those difficulties and I was making dua to Allah and I was trying and he goes, I had that mindset of whatever happens, I have to get out. He goes, years, I spent years begging Allah. My dua used to be, Ya Allah, I am not blaming you. The blame is with me. Like, all I want you to do, Ya Allah, is show me where the blame is. Like, just, I just need to know where, what, what, is, what have I done wrong so I can fix it with the permission of Allah, right? And he's like, I had that mindset. And he goes, I got out of it with the permission of Allah. And then he said something deep. He said, would I want to not go back through that stuff again? Like, if, 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 if I could go back, would I... Want to not live that life? Never. Did you know what I realized? He said, Fi man'ihi When Allah prevents you, He's actually giving. When He gives you, He's giving. And when He's preventing, He's actually giving. But He's giving you something else. He's giving you resilience. He's giving you what? Grit. He's giving you some lesson that you can learn to be able to later deal with mm. some other thing in life. Do you understand? So, again, like, look, people go into David Goggins and you might read that book, but here's the thing, because this, this is the angle I think you wanted to also take it, is that the Quran Sunnah has all of this. Like, I'll give you an example, yeah? I'll give you an example. Have you ever deeped? You know, Ammar ibn Yasir, he, he, he's the one who was killed in the, in the battle, uh, I think the battle of uh, Sifin, right? He was killed in the battle of Sifin. Or, no, no, he was killed in the battle of Nah Naharwan. No, is it Naharwan? Is it the, 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 the Khawarij? Yeah, yeah, Nahar is it the Nahar Khawarij, right? Yeah, it's about the Naharwan. Was it with uh, Sifin? Uh, he was killed. He was martyred. And uh, <laughs> you know you deep when Ammar as a kid. And I really want people to just deep this for a second. This is why I'll be honest, man. I just can't rate this. Trauma being used as an excuse to not move forward. Trauma exists. Let it fuel you. Let it, let it, let it, let it push you forward. 
Let, like learn from it. But trauma and I can't move, I don't read that. Ammar, as a, as a young man, saw his mother being murdered in front of his eyes by Abu Jahl, put a spear through her legs, man, and killed her. Then his father, Yasir, some of the narrations that I came across mention that um, they attached a uh, a le uh, they attached his horse, uh, they attached his uh, hands and legs to different horses. And then they told the horses, run. They made the horses run and split him and mash and, and kill him like that. He saw that. And while he was seeing this while they were torturing him, then he, he manages to escape and manages to do hijrah. And as he's doing hijrah, he's come to Medina now, he's building the blocks of the masjid. The Prophet said, the Prophet says, Wayha, Ammar, oh yeah, Ammar, He says, Whoa, 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 yeah, Ammar. Taqtuluhu, yaqtulu fi'at al Rebellious group is going to kill him. Like imagine a young man, just seen his mother, or he's just seen his father killed. And then the Messenger of Allah, who is receiving revelation, who is talking certainty, he's, he's looking at you and you know what he says to you? He's going to be killed. Okay, how would, just put yourself in those shoes for a second. Yeah? How would your response be? What would you say to the Prophet at that time? What would you say something like that? If, if the Prophet said that to you, what would you, if, what, what, what would you say? Just take your back. I don't know. Huh? I answered this question to the sheikh. Huh? I answered the question to the sheikh that day. You answered, yeah? I just. I, I don't, don't know. know. I don't, I don't know. know. This is... What would you say? Bro, Amar did nothing. Kept it moving. And not only that, you don't see any effect in the rest of his life, the statement affected. You don't see him like extra caution, nervous, stressed. When you look at Amar's life, you were just put together, man. Getting it on. Getting, just getting it on with life. You need to go to battle, go to battle. I need to serve the Muslims, I'll serve the Muslims. You need to do this, you need to do that. If I need to do this, I need to do that. Not just that, he was Ali radiallahu right hand man. He was there throughout the whole mashakil, the conflict, there. Right, Uthman was told the same thing, radiallahu yeah. The Prophet sallallahu told Uthman, you're going to be killed. You know what Uthman said? To Allah we seek help Kept it moving Became the Khalifa Used to teach Quran Used to do judgment Travel I just feel like it's, it's People need to understand that A lot of the things we're seeking for outside And I'm not going to lie I started off like most Muslims probably did right I started off with personal development books Before the deen Yeah Right because I was learning business And all these things Before I started practicing right So you know, you start off, but when I started practicing the deen, you know, and I'm seeing the statements of the Salaf, you know, and I'm seeing all these different things, I'm like, I can't even, I don't even rate these books no more. You know, I remember I told you, I was like, bro, sometimes I read these books and I'm like, it's like this guy just started to read pages of the Sirah and just stole it and put his name on it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's what life is, how it feels, bro. Because I've always said, like, if you look at the most successful people, a lot of them have, like, high trauma mm. one way or another you know like they've been through some level of trauma they have something that is like we discussed the last day like dragging them mm. does that make sense like something that's in their heads so for me the idea of people like not achieving in life or not pushing to like do more because of something they've been through i think it's 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 mere excuse right and that's what we know is that people like to, to they're just in the now right they like to say the reason i'm here is because of this thing because it's easier for me to accept that the reason I'm flopping is because of anything else but me. <laughs> that's that's just how it is, right? It's yeah. easier. As we know, like, bro, we've all been to that stage where, like, <clears throat> even companies, right? We led companies. How long did it take for us to be like, maybe, maybe it's me. Like, yo, maybe I'm the problem in the company. Maybe it's not this assistant or this guy, this employee. Maybe I'm actually the problem. So, Yanni, when I started to look at the seerah of the Prophet Sallam, and then you read about so the Sahabas as well. They had this thing where they always held themselves okay. before they even looked at the people. Mm. They looked at themselves, mm, mm, mm. you know. And that's when I started to internalize. We've always heard the statement of Umar bin Khattab where he says, "Hold yourself to account yeah. before you held to account." But people don't internalize that. Like, what does it mean to hold yourself to account? It means whenever something happens, whenever you take a loss in life, you don't point at anyone else before you look at yourself. 
You know, I was telling the brothers because they were asking me, like, how do you deal with loss, even in business and anything? I go, when I lose in business, first thing I check is my relationship with Allah. Uh -huh. They were shook. They were like, okay, we're expecting maybe, like, you know, you look at the company uh -huh. or this or that. It was now the first thing I'm checking is my relationship with Allah. Because something clearly, maybe Allah is dragging me back. Because that's when, yani, a lot of us come back uh -huh. to the deen, right? When uh -huh. we go through issues. You know, I sat in a room with brothers and I asked them, like, we, it was one of the freshly grounded questions. It was like, when, what was the time you felt most closest to Allah? Every brother, it was, he mentioned a traumatic situation. It was after a trial or tribulation. Mm. So it taught me something. It taught me that it's necessary to use these situations as fuel. Again, number one, to get closer to Allah. And that's why Allah tests people when they're mm. slowly getting off the path. He puts tests, he puts mashakil mm. in their lives, problems. So they realize that, yo, we're in not dependent. Well, oh, sorry, we are dependent. You know, so if, uh, I feel like these books, they're great. You know, subhanAllah, I was reading about, you know, Ibn al Qayyim rahimahullah's statement. You know, I can read one of his like statements. Well, I just think about it like for days. You know, he was talking about even the nafs. And this is what they talk about in the books. Like you have to control, gain control, control over yourself. your what? Yourself, yeah. right? And Ibn al Qayyim, he says like, when you start to become like, the first time you succumb to your nafs, slowly you become weaker and weaker until it takes complete control over you. You mm. don't even have to, you don't even like control yourself. Mm. You know, and so, have you not seen the one who takes his what? His desires as a God. It's just everything he wants, he goes for it. And then you see these books talk about what? They talk about saying no to yourself, mm. not giving the things that you want straight Delaying away. Delaying instant gratification, instant right? Gra like, you know what I'm saying? And, and even, I can't remember which book it was, but I was reading, they were saying that even if there's a situation where it's like, like to go above and beyond, to, 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 to like even when you know you should and you can uh, mm. indulge in something, sometimes it's good to prevent yourself from it, mm. just to train yourself who, that, 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 you're, that you're actually in charge of yourself, right? And I remember when I read that, I said, brother, you lot don't even know the levels. I came across this, uh, this statement, our Sheikh told us once about Hassan al-Basri, the situation. One time, Hassan al-Basri, you know, he used to pray the night prayer, he used to pray long night prayer, long night prayer. One day, I keep smoking, so tired. He was so, I couldn't stand to pray. Could not pray. So he lay down in bed. But he didn't go to sleep. He prevented himself from falling asleep. And as he's fighting with himself, keeping himself awake, even though he's so tired, you know what he says to, him, to, to his nephew? He said, you prevented me from standing at night. I'm preventing you from sleep. <laughs> and that's, that's something we look at the self-development work. So what did he talk about? Punish yourself. Right? Mm. Punish yourself. Whenever you slip out or step out of line, mm you have some sort of punishment mechanism yeah. on yourself. And again, it goes back it, to the statement. Some, that some people might not, not like that word punishment, but trust mm. me, it's all the same thing. They might say leverage, they might say friction. Mm. They use different terms to say the same thing, yeah. which is... Like there should be some, punishment. you lose out on something now. Yeah. Now that you've done something wrong, you lose out on something. And like I said, you, you look at the statements like uh, you, of, the, of the Salaf, you look at the Sahabas, there are certain times like they put themselves in tough situations mm. because they've done something wrong. You know, like, and that's, that's what, one thing they talk about as well is knowing yourself, yeah. right? Knowing your weaknesses, knowing your strengths. Then I remember one of the Sahabas, I forgot the name, but he's like, Ya Allah, you know me and I know me. Mm. So you're actually having that level of like reflection. You're learning, understanding yourself. So this is what I mean, like, I'm getting tired of these books because they're great and all. But it's like every time I read something, I'm like, yeah, I've seen that already now. But you know what the mushkila is though? Mm. We, the, 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 what the books have is research and organized thoughts on a particular subject mm. which we need students of knowledge to start doing we need brothers to start seeking knowledge to get this like i told you there's, there's a there's a brother who's a serious student of knowledge in egypt who's actually a professor in one of the american universities okay. and he's a professor of um of project management and he uses his skills that he learned in terms of idara like management to write but he takes it through the lens of the Quran and Sunnah, because he's a talib ilm as well. So he bases it on 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 on, on principles from the deen. Mm. And anything that they mention in management, which is batil, presents it to the deen. If it's wrong, he'll he'll dash it away. And if it's in line with the deen, we'll use the deen as a, as a, as a foundation. 
I said, we need more of this. Like, we need people to study these things. Because otherwise, we've got, no, we've got no choice but to read X, Y, Z. Because, like you said, there's certain researches that... Remember, look, the Quran is not a book of science. It's not a book of history. It's not a book of personal development. The Quran is a book of hidayah, guidance. Does that make sense? But it's a, one of its <laughs> greatnesses is that in it guiding you, it guides you. Allah said, Quran This Quran, it guides you to that which is the best and most upright of affairs. So this Quran has got guidance. And in that guidance, you'll find guidance with regards to not just deen, which is the, the main thing, guys, Allah, but you'll find guidance to what? Transactions, money, business, relationships, family, productivity. You'll find guidance to mental health, mental, all of this. You know what? Because a person uses, remember the Quran's here speaking, it's, it's speaking to humans, isn't it? The humans use these things to get close to Allah. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes if you pattern your relationship properly, you can get to Jannah. And if you don't, take the hell fire. So a part of that is knowing how to, how to come correct with these things in the Quran and Sunnah. It really does that. You know, one of the one of the things, one of the biggest lessons, wallahi, Allah protect me, forgive me, I mean, because it annoyed me that I took this lesson from a kafir. And this is one of the biggest things in the deen. It's one of the biggest things in the deen. And uh, that we take it for granted. Like, it, a kafir explained it for in a in, in a batil way, by the way, in a batil way. But when he explained it, he made me. I was like, it made me reflect, and then I was like, <clears throat> I see where he's going with this in falsehood. And then I was like, right, this really is a solution here. Like I, I just and it, and it made me feel like, like we actually have it. So basically, what he was saying was, he was saying, you know, one of the worst things you can do is when you're alone, you don't perform. To the highest standard that you perform when you're with people. He said, when you're with people and you're in the gym, you put the extra effort in. He said, one of the worst things you could do is that when you're alone, to give up before when the people were there. Uh, to, to, to give up before you would, if the people were there. Likewise, he's like, if you work hard when people are there, but you don't work hard when, you're, when, when people are not there, it's one of the worst things you do. Why is it one of the worst things you could do? Is it because you're actually teaching yourself and you're programming yourself is that you're a person who when it gets hard and you're alone actually gives up you're a person who's trained you're training you're actually training yourself every time that happens because what i used to do exactly when i used to go to the gym if i trained with someone i'd go hard wallahi forget act for, for, for forget Giving up early when I go alone, I wouldn't even go alone because I already knew. I I already I already knew I wasn't really about it, and it happened because one time I actually went to the gym and I tried to do the the dumbbell um, uh, chest press right, and I found it hard, and no one was there. You know what I did? The absolute joke, man. You know what I did? If you also aspire to be a successful entrepreneur but don't have an idea of where to start, which business route to go down, then we might be able to help you. At the Umrah Setup 2.0, we've been helping brothers set up their own successful and profitable Umrah companies. If that sounds like something that you'd be interested in, then click the link below, jump on a call with one of our team to see if this program is the right fit for you. With that said, once more, let's get back into the episode, inshallah. Put the dumbbells back and I left. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, well, like I did one set and I said, yeah, well, I put the dumbbells back. I said, this is dead. <laughs> this is your life is dead. Like, you know that, how bad that was for me? Like, for a whole two years, I only ever went gym. Someone went with me. And, well, like, even when I'm with the brother, I'm only pushing myself if he's pushing himself. If he's not pushing I'm just giving up. I really actually trained myself that. I trained myself to only go hard when people are there. And I trained myself to believe that I don't actually put the hard work in when I'm alone. And then that creates a very bad self-narrative, which is that I give up easily. I quit easily. I'm, I'm, I'm not really hard working. So he was like, when you're alone, and this is the moral of the story, show yourself what you're made of. But then I was like, bro, we were taught something like that. We're not exactly. We were taught 
Don't behave a certain way in front of people when you're alone in front of Allah behaving. Show Allah your best self. Show Allah your best version. That is really where the benefit is. It's not even about myself. Because myself at the end of the day, I'm what if I show myself I'm X, Y, Z? Show my Lord. And imagine I get myself in the habit of constantly showing my Lord who's the best, who's perfect, who expects me to show him the best. I'm always going to push myself when I'm alone to be the best. Even when I'm in the gym now, for example, there's certain things that Umar makes me do, which is jarring. I don't want to do it, brother. And I'm smoked. I'm tired. I'm, and he's like, I have to do it. So then, you know, I did one time, he, um, he, uh, he, he told me to do a certain exercise, right? Uh, rare delt exercise. I'm like, it's not on it. And he walked away because he's always watching me. When he's watching me, no, you haven't failed yet. Keep going. <laughs> one time, bro, he walked away and I was like, you know what? Just... Kind of whatever it just be done with it because I can't but then I said to myself don't go back to Imran and that time I, I was like Ya Allah this I'm because I, I started going back to the gym because I want to be strong for your sake so I I did it and I was bro I did it so hard there was as I finished the set and I went to failure there was a guy behind me screaming saying you don't have to be so loud <laughs> 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 and I was completely alone alhamdulillah but my point is that yeah man like but look so it's there, there's a little khayr But bruv, it's not complete without the deen That's, that's the point we're trying to get at, isn't it? What do you think, Saad? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the point that I was mentioning earlier Which is true um, Look, there's another uh, perspective as well Which is the Quran has a lot of these principles um, But they're general Okay, in not all cases are you going to find specific things For example, you want to learn about how to be a specific leader in a business as an entrepreneur in the online, you know, world, <laughs> right? That Facebook ads and stuff right? like that. So something like that, you're not going to necessarily find the tafsilat, I mean, the detailed matters in the Quran, right? So you go to these books to find that information. Um, but the overall general rules and perspectives and, you know, the principles that Allah has laid out in the Quran is enough to get you started. And that's why you have to take both. You can't just go, you know, just lean on... Yeah. Um, the statements of um, just these book, uh, the statements within these books. You take the Quran and then you develop upon that based upon these small, these very specific things that you want to learn. So, Barakallah, let me ask a question. What's the what are you reading right now? Now, other than, of course, I'm I just want to mention to people. Obviously, we mentioned we're reading like a book a week or not, but the asr for me every day is, is <coughs> reading Islamic books, reading Sharia knowledge. You know, that for me is the asr. So, a day that goes by without that. You know, it's long. The only day where I may not read much, even though I do, truth, truth be told, but I might read less than other days is, is Friday. But um, uh, that's 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 the default, right? You know what I'm saying. But now, come to the come to the coughs. What you what cafe are you reading right now? <laughs> uh, to be honest, you know, I realized over the last six months I was trying to read Blue Ocean um, strategy, but I never completed it. Um, <laughs> Uh, obviously, just you know, my wife's pregnant, so I got busy with a lot of things. So I, I didn't get the time to do it properly. So I, I picked it up the other day again. Okay. So I'm reading it from the beginning. Um, that's my focus. I'm trying to create my own blue ocean. Blue ocean. I love so that no competition. Inshallah. I love very. Yeah. I love that. Mashallah. So blue ocean strategy. The book's about. It's a book about business strategy. I'm reading. Uh, read people like a book. Read people like a book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so going, what have you read about me so far? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Like, see, sometimes. Like, I found that the best way to get things out of this book, because sometimes you read something, it's just like a Quran as well, right? And you think of other people. But the best way is to view yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. so even when I read these books about dealing with my team, etc., I'm like, okay, how are you going to deal with you first? Mm -hmm. You know? So if, uh, I, I love these books. I'm not going to lie to you, right? Because they increase me in the event, truth be told, right? Because whenever I read these books, I just see how perfect Islam is. Mm -hmm. Because all the best things inside them... It's already in the deen. You know, the best self-development concepts are already in the deen. Mm. And if you want to dig deeper for more context, you can read a lot of statements of the Salaf that summarize things that they've wrote whole bro, books on. Big on thing, bro. We're reading al fawaid by Ibn al-Qayyim, mm. which is just lines of benefits. And I'm like, bro, honestly, I've Ibn seen this. Ibn al is just... Oh, I'm a lie. If he puts me in some, you know, like overthinking phase, you know, he starts to... Ponder deeply, you know, 
Like even we did like recently, um, cause I was telling the people like, I used to have this morning routine to be honest with you. I wake up, I do Fajr Adhkar, whatever. I'm a Quran in the morning. Then straight away, the first thing I always used to do is read like one quote from like a business person, right? And extract benefits or one like chapter, just any like extract from that. I've been doing this for years. I mean, for like three, four years plus. SubhanAllah, I watched one of the Ustad's videos and you know, he, he's talking on the clip where he's like, we need to know the what? The Salaf. We need to know the what? The Salaf. We need to know who they are, what they did. You know, he was asking, do you even know the name? Is it Ustad Abdul Rahman? Yeah, Ustad Abdul Rahman Hassan yeah. in the okay. first uh, da'wah. Uh -huh. He's asking, do you even know uh, Ibn al Qayyim rahimahullah's name? Shame. <laughs> you know, he starts to ask, yani, do you know this? This the Um Salama? Damn. I need to do better so i started i was like i'm gonna put away these like extracts from the uh, kuffar away for a second i'm gonna start reading a statement of the salaf every day first thing in the morning a statement and i'm gonna extract for it from it extract wow. benefits from it and we actually because i was doing it i said you know what let me put on our email listing we we're like we told them look for the next seven days each of the days is going to be like a statement of the Salaf and we're going to provide the benefits. Wow. Wallahi, people, and like they were giving us more feedback. They were enjoying that than any other content we've ever posted in the past before in our lives. And even me, I started to enjoy this. I started to, well, I, it was beautiful for me because I know these are pious people. These are the pious predecessors. And these concepts are just beautiful. You know, and I'm implementing them in my daily life, like trying to every time, I, like one of them was, it was even talking about our relationship with food. I, I really don't think human, like, especially Muslims understand like how destructive food is to like your, your nefs, how much it can like destroy you. And it's something I'm not going to lie. I never took seriously. Like I just used to eat whatever. Well, like now I've changed it. I eat fruit in the morning and I eat at Maghrib and that's it. Because I've noticed the days where I eat like a lot or I do over the third, like the Prophet you know, advises, I start to feel sluggish. My brain isn't working as efficiently. I'm tired. And then I looked at the Sunnah of the Prophet He used to eat very light in the morning. Very, very light in the morning. And then again, at Maghrib time, it would be around his heaviest meal. So when I started to like, you know, embed that in my life and whenever I have heavy breakfasts, I'm not, I start to just, I pass out halfway through the day. Mm. I just can't do anything, you know? So this is where I started to learn that all these concepts, if we just look back, you know, even some of the hadith that talk about how to live this productive thing, what do they always talk about in these careful books in the morning? Again, you know the Prophet yeah, book, literally. they made the dua to put yeah, right, in the morning right. time. Yeah. So it's like... Uh, especially, I'm not talking about just, the it's business. Not, it's not things. just morning. Mm. You know the importance they give on sleep. And mm. what did the Prophet say? The Prophet said, after Isha, don't so stay so. awake. Mm. Don't talk to anyone. The only, thing, only for words that should come out of your mouth after Isha is if you talk to your wife, you're worshiping Allah. Otherwise, go to sleep. And they talk about broken sleep is good for you. Yeah. Like not sleeping eight hours. What do we know? The Prophet said, used to stand in the middle of the night for tajjid. And then and go back to sleep be, for a small exactly, part. Go back to sleep for a small part. So when I look at all these things, I'm like, Prophet lived that. I'm not talking about the business side. The Absolutely. business side, of course, we need to seek a bit deeper for that. You know, times have changed as well in terms of business, then the online. But in terms of self-development, they provide oh, like further even, detail, like but even, the dean has everything. Like even principles of business. Mm. Like, as in, you can, like, you know, I was reading this book called um, uh, The Bezos Letters. Which, to be honest, very good book here. <laughs> very good book by one kafir. The Bezos letters is about the 14 principles that Jeff Bezos built Amazon off. And Amazon is a trillion dollar company. So, man, slightly knows what he's talking about, right? <laughs> and one of the principles he talks about is obsess over the customer. Because Amazon's very customer obsessive. And to the point where they mentioned that, you know, when a customer, like, um, you know, like, when there's a mistake, go above and beyond and give him a refund. Do X, Y, Z, you know, just, just give it to him quickly kind of thing. Now, of course, you can't ask for refunds when you're violating and there's no right to ask for the refund, but just give it, right? So there's actually a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She says, whoever gives someone back what you would call a refund, even if he doesn't deserve it, Allah will make things easier for you on the day of judgment. 
So there's times when a guy's not due a refund. He's not even due. And by this, you have to balance this because we applied this with our business shoulder match at one point and people started violating, just asking for refunds left, right, center, and then we weren't making payday <laughs> for our employees. <laughs> Then we obviously have to put things in place. Like guys yeah. clearly use the app. He's used the app. He's made a profile. He's he's he's, he's sent, you know, requests and nice as I want a refund, brother. No, but every now and again, and again, you know, you have to look at cash flow. You have to look at are you meet, meeting your numbers. But sometimes, you know, what you might do, you might. As in, th th I don't see Amazon saying give refunds when a guy doesn't deserve it. No, they just say when a guy, when a guy what, when a guy a mistake, man, yeah. when, a, when there's a mistake, give him a refund straight away. That's their thing, right? Even the Prophet Sassam said, pay someone before their sweat dries. The guy who done the work paying for his, his sweat dries, right? So pay him straight away kind of thing. But ala kullin, the deen told you to go above and beyond, which is sometimes he doesn't even deserve the refund, just give it to him. And I'll tell you something, man. There was a situation, there was a brother, he asked for a refund. He asked for a refund for something that we did, that, that, that we sold him. And he asked for a refund like an hour after he purchased. And brother, it's clear. He actually clearly says like, this is a non-refundable thing. Once you've done it, you won't be able to get a refund. The sales team show it to him. He has to click a button, which means he understands there's no refund. He still asked for one anyway. And even then, a bucker got on the phone to him. And uh, the guy was like, brother, like, e look, I understand even if you don't give it to me, don't, but I'm just kind of asking. And um, his situation was a little bit different. His situation was a little bit different, right? I don't want anyone watching this to take advantage. Like you honestly have to feel Allah because then this, what, if you take advantage of what I'm saying right now, is it, this is the thing that, help, that stops Muslims from injecting goodwill and, and doing khayr. They start thinking yes. people take advantage, so now I, I have to be a little bit more thing. So the asr is, we don't give refunds. His situation is a little bit different. You know what? He messaged within an hour. He messaged within an hour. I have to be fair to everyone, right? It was clear that this was something. Different. Like he messaged within an hour of paying. He said, you know what I'm saying? So you know what Bucket did? He just gave him the money back. You know what he did, bro? Two days later, he said, ah, here's the money, bro. Put me back on. <laughs> like, you actually, it, like, you know how they say reciprocity? Like, do good. Inject good to people. They will give you good back. Like, forget customer satisfaction, which is give the customer the refund he deserves straight away. We're being told, sometimes even give him a refund when he doesn't even deserve. It's even greater satisfaction. But honestly, what I would like people, if you take what I'm saying unrestrictedly, you will you can go bankrupt, yeah? Because I'm telling you, shit, it's happened to a lot. Like, people, people take the, the mix. Like, yeah, but you, you, you know, some guys access a product, bro, for like three months and then you, and you know, ask for it. Right, come on, bro. If, if you access the product three months, even if you didn't use it, that's your hell, bro. Yeah. I'm, say, I'm saying, you know what is? You have to look at every situation. Here, a person... Mm. Within an hour, it was it was different, and he needed it. it was a fam not just that his brother messaged us saying mm. it's a family emergency. It was a few different things. You get me, but like it's upon you every now and again. You have that mercy in your heart. Do you know what I'm saying to you? And this this the thing that the the, the dean teaches us, man. And even one of the biggest concepts that I feel like we should mention mm. is this concept of positive thinking that the kufar talks about, like optimism, mm. seeing that you you believe in you can do good. It's, one of, it's such a big aspect of the deen, Hassan right? <laughs> Having and and, and Allah, the Prophet Islam, he, he talks about good assumptions that, yeah, sorry, of Allah, good thinking, right? And the, in the hadith, he goes, "Yani, my slave, I am what my I'm a, I am as my slave thinks of me." Yeah, such a big thing because when you see, like, sometimes you see, for example, Muslims they're broke. They're like, yeah, "Allah wished for me to be broken," but if you had good thinking that Allah wishes for me to gain rizq. So I can benefit the people. It's just a process. Hey, I, Allah will give you risk. Shall, shall I tell you how deep, you tell you deep it is? Yeah. You know, one thing that people, when you read these self-help books and business books, you find a lot, right? You find a common theme and a common thread which guys talk about. They say repetitively. <laughs> they say, uh, you know, difficulty and embrace it. Embrace the challenge. When you go through difficulty, it's building you for something greater. Hard times create strong men. You know what I'm saying? All this kalam. You know when we learn about um, brother, I'm not sure if you saw brother Hewa asked a question in our in our social media influencers group. Yeah. He said uh, like, is it better to be, like he said, what's the delil that being grateful is better than being patient? And to the point where you're, to, to, to the point where you're being grateful for your calamity. And then I responded to him and I said something and I said, bro, you know what's mad? You know, the highest form of shukar is not on the blessing. But it's on what? 
calamity. Like the, the ulama actually discuss, they say, uh, they discuss what's better, patience or gratitude. And then some of us go, and Ibn Uthaymin discusses this in his explanation of Al-Wasthiya by Ibn Uthaymin. He said that the highest level that you can reach, yeah, is that when there's a calamity, uh, the, uh, sorry, 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 in, in not necessarily the highest level of shukr, but the highest level of dealing with the calamity, the best way of dealing with, with difficulty, that's what I should say like that. The first way is that you accept it and you're patient, right? Another is that you accept it, you're patient, and what? You're pleased. I'm pleased. But another level is you accept it, you're patient, you're pleased. Grateful. You accept this to me. Because you know you're being purified of sins, you're being expiated, you're becoming a better person, a better man, closer to Allah. Perhaps Allah is preventing something because he's, gonna, he's, he's saving you from, from a greater evil or he's preventing you today to give to you tomorrow. Like, they just understood that. Do you get me? So, mm. like, and it's, it's, it's actually insane that you said this positive thinking and whatnot come that you connected to Hasan Dhan because in Adawa, Ibn, Ibn, Ibn al Qayyim actually argues that the foundation from which shirk comes is bad assumptions of Allah, like negative thoughts about Allah, and, and the foundation upon which tawheed comes from is positive thoughts about Allah, Azawajal, and that positive thoughts and that optimism and thinking good of Allah, and Allah is actually taking care of you. Is is that actually is where Tawheed comes from? <laughs> yeah, and honestly, the, the beautiful thing is you can never feel like overly depressed. Yeah. You have like Husnul Dhan. Because you know something is coming. Yeah. You know? And you know, whatever I'm going through, ultimately, there is Khair that's going to follow it. Because mm. So that's what I'm saying. That's such a big concept in these books. But even the stories of the prophets, you know, subhanAllah, one of the things I always tell people is they're not just stories. You need to actually like sometimes you're going to relate to different prophets at different times or different sections in your life things you went through you know i remember the story of yusuf i used to love it but it's not until i went through like a specific situation that it became more beloved to me you know so this is one thing i always tell the people like read about the prophets and honestly i want to say like i feel like a lot of muslims these days the reason they take these kuffar as role models because we haven't been taught about the prophets we haven't been taught about the salaf as well you know, and I'm seeing it's an increasing problem, especially like, you know, we grew up watching Cristiano Ronaldo, Messi. We knew who to look up to, who to idolize. But how many parents like sit there and talk to their children Allah is true. about the Salaf? Allah is true. Majority of them can't even name like three battles that happen at the time of the process. At, at, to the point where, you know, when you think of, and like what, what what's the image that, of, that, that everyone thinks of nowadays? Like a guy who's rich, wealthy, right? And people... That that's like a great accomplished man, someone that we should want to be like, right? But at the same time, we also know from a spiritual angle, like the greatest type of person that you can have is a scholar, right? A person of knowledge and deen and, and whatnot. So people think, but those are two things that you can't combine. Like man can't actually combine being extremely wealthy and extremely rich, but at the same time being extremely knowledgeable and devout in my deen. But if you actually looked at the Sahab and the Salaf, you find both. Like there are at least five from the 10 companions promised Jannah who are the highest level companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at least 5 who are from the richest men on Allah's earth richest on Allah Azza wa Jal's earth Uthman ibn Awf Abd al-Rahman uh, ibn Awf Uthman ibn Affan Abd Bakr al-Siddiq radiyallahu an and so on and so forth not just that you got Layth ibn Sa'ad who was more knowledgeable than Imam Malik he was more knowledgeable than Imam Malik people are thinking who's Layth? who's Layth ibn Sa'ad? He was more knowledgeable than Imam Malik. What Imam Malik was in, Imam Malik was in Medina, Layth ibn Sa'ad was in Egypt. So he was more knowledgeable than Imam Malik. And you know who's telling you he's more knowledgeable than Imam Malik? Imam Malik's student, Imam Shafi. He said, Layth afqah min Malik. He was more knowledgeable than Imam Malik. <laughs> Do you understand? So, who, so who's this Layth who's more knowledgeable than Imam Malik? He's not just more knowledgeable than Imam Malik. He's richer than Imam Malik. How rich is he? How rich is Layth ibn Sa'ad? He's so rich that Imam Malik one time, because Imam Malik and Layth were very close. You know, scholars don't ask people for things. But you know when you're someone's like your boy, you can ask him. Like, for example, this is my brother, right? But there's, I won't ask people for certain things, but I was say, can you just send this to me, please? It's like that relationship is there, you know? So Layth and Malik had that relationship. They had that relationship. These two great scholars, one in Medina, one in Egypt. So when, Layth, uh, when Malik's daughter was getting married, he asked for some za'faran. He asked for what? Za'faran. Now, za'faran, saffron, saffron. 
Someone told me, and I have to double check this fact, but he said it's actually more expensive than gold. So when you look at, if you, if you were to get the weight of saffron in gold, the saffron is, as in, is actually works out to be more expensive and valuable. That, that, that weight, like one cage of gold, one cage of saffron, saffron is more. Like saffron is apparently, well, Allah Alam is, is, one, is, is, is one of the most expensive things that you can find on earth. And whether it's more expensive than gold or not is relevant, it is very expensive. Saffron is extremely expensive. And, it, and the Arabs would use it for weddings. So you ask for some saffron. He send me some saffron for my daughter's wedding, right? Cool, now check this. What does Leif do? How wealthy and rich was this great imam? That he sends him a jar? A bag? No. He grabs a camel. And he loads up the camel with saffron. And if I'm not mistaken, not one, multiple camels he sends with saffron on his back. Go to Medina. Imam Malik takes what he wants from the saffron. He sells the rest in the market and keeps the money for himself because it was a gift given to him from his friend. And Laith ibn Sa'ad still had a fortune left after that. Like imagine sending a caravan with saffron on his back with his massively expensive uh, product thing. And just send it to your friend Adi. Like he was rich. My valley. And I'll be honest with you, your point is valid. The fact that we don't hear these stories, we don't aspire. Like, man can't act well. Like, I've actually had people sit in front of me tell me, you can't have knowledge and, and, and money. Pick one. You lied to me. Never said that. It was a both his lie. Now it's true, some people can't have both. It's true. Some people it might destroy him, some people one or the other. It's true. It's true, it's true, it's true, it's true, it's true. But for some it's possible. Inshallah, why can't it be possible for man? I can't be possible for me. Why can't it be possible for you? Do you get me? Well, that's the concept of like Husna Dhan for me. Like a mm. lot of people, like they've put these bad mm. assumptions on Allah mm. and in turn on themselves. Yeah. And that's why they're not achieving in life. You know? I've noticed like even no matter what you go through, as long as you think Allah is going, mm. you will see like Allah is going to get you through it. Like, and that's why we all love pain, I think, mm. you know? When you get to a level of, like, success, you start to love pain. Like, we recently went through a huge problem within our business, right? I, I, was, I was so happy. They couldn't understand it. I was like, guys, we're extracting so much forward from this that in the future, so much benefits. In the future, look, when we launch this again, it's going to be so clean. Mm. We know exactly what to happen. But if, if, if it was a win, we would have never looked back. Mm. We would have never like seen what should we have added, what should mm. we have removed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you start to think like there's good in this. Mm. Once you think there's good in something, you look for the good. Mm. And if you look for the good, you'll find you'll it. You'll find it. Well, I for Zakh man, honestly, I really appreciate man uh, the benefits that you shared today and Saad as well, who always doesn't talk much, but when he does, he gives us something juicy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, Allah bless you, brothers and sisters. I hope you guys really found benefit, man, and, and, and took some benefit from that, inshallah. Got a few more with Brother Fawaz that hopefully you guys can benefit from as well. With that said, till next time, subhanakallah, subhanakallah, wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa tu ilayk, salamu alaykum, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How's that? Yeah.